sweet. What's up, everybody? Hello. Three, two, three, three. We're on three point four. Yeah. It's two plus two equals your head, Pete. Oh, there. <laughs> I agree. Five. <clears throat> All right. Well, if you got questions, let's get over those and then we can start 3.4. Uh, yes, sir. I do have one question uh, concerning problem number 12 in 3.1. John, number 12 in 3.1? Yes. All right. Oh, good stuff. All right. Okay. Do so you want me to cover that one? Yes, please. Okay, cool. 3.1. Go, 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 go. There we go. <clears throat> Twelve. All right. I see F of X equals D square root of X minus four. And this says do the difference quotient. So A, we want to know what is f of x plus h. So I would do the square root of x plus h minus 4, which just becomes the square root of x plus h minus 4. OK. Can't do anything else on that step. So the next step. Keep it the same. What is f of x plus h minus f of x? And you take x plus h minus 4, and you subtract the original one. And again, done. Can't do anything here. <clears throat> and then next, c f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And we take all of this, x plus h minus 4 minus x minus 4, put it all over h. And now, since we weren't able to do anything on the first step, second step, we have to do something on this third step. Awesome. Our job is to get rid of this h. That pesky H, that's our whole goal in life with the difference quotient. you got to get rid of that H. So that means we have to somehow get rid of this numerator. And the only way to do that is to multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. So remember that my conjugate is if I have A plus the square root of B, I would multiply by a minus the square root of b. Or the other way around. If it's a minus square root of b, I multiply by a plus square root of b. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to multiply this whole difference quotient by the conjugate of the numerator. So x plus h minus 4 plus square root of x minus 4 over the same thing, x plus h minus 4 
plus square root x minus four. You good so far? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> and also, one thing to realize is that the conjugate is just equal to one. The conjugate is a manipulation by one. And I say that because anything over itself is one. So just keep that in mind. There's certain things that are called a manipulation by one, such as getting a common denominator. Okay. So here I put parentheses around everything and we get to foil the numerator. Okay. So when I do square root of x plus h minus four times square root of x plus h minus four, they are the same root, which means they will cancel and just leave me with x plus h minus four. And then when I do x plus h minus four times the square root of x minus four minus the square root of x minus four times the square root of x plus eh, x plus h minus four, what's going to happen to your middle term? Uh, cancel out. It'll cancel out. Good. Yes. So we don't get a middle term. And then the last part is minus square root of x minus four times the square root of x minus four. So those are gonna cancel and leave you with x minus four. Make sure to leave that in parentheses. Over h times all of this. And then fix the numerator, x plus h minus four minus x uh, plus four over h times all of that. And we see that after this, <clears throat> my x's cancel, my fours cancel. And I'm left with h over h times all of that. <laughs> and what's going to happen to your h's? Cancel out. Cancel out. Gone, gone. And now we're left with the final answer of 1 over the square root of x plus h minus 4 plus the square root of x minus four. Now, were, were you having issues with that one? Uh, yes, I was, because uh, I thought I had the answer before, but I guess I forgot the very last step to where I was supposed to cancel the H's put the one above. And it's yeah. always, you know, because the error message kept saying that while I do have the correct answer, it's not in the proper format. You know, I always put uh, the uh, the x plus h minus four minus uh, the the x minus four at the top and the h at the bottom. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Negative. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. All right. What else? Any other questions? Uh, I think I have another question. Just one moment to find which number it is. For sure. In the meantime, 
Here are the notes we're going to cover today. Let me post those in case you haven't downloaded them yet. 3.4. There you go. Notes are in the chat for the ones we're going to cover today. Okay, I can't find the exact problem, but I remember what the question was. Uh, on the interval notation, mm -hmm. uh, like for instance, if the uh, if the x coordinate comes out to be just a positive eight, and the the interval notation always starts with a bracket, what I got confused is that in one of the problems, the answer turned out to be just the parentheses instead of bracket. What actually controls what that start like? Uh, what makes it start with the parentheses or bracket? Oh, good, notation. good question. Yeah. So was it from a graph or an inequality that you were looking uh, at? I think it was in a, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the function problems of f of x equals uh, so on. Hmm. Let me see. Was that in 3.2 or 3.1? It is 3.1, yes. 3.1. Well, maybe you can find what you're looking for. Let's see. 3.1. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I found it. It's number 18. Number 18. Number 18. Okay. Yes. Ah, good. Okay. So that is 3.1. Okay. So the reason this has a parentheses is, well, let's first look at this. If f of x was the square root of x plus 8. Your domain for this one, you would take whatever's in the house and set it greater than or equal to 0. So this means you get x greater than or equal to negative 8, which means your notation would be bracket negative 8 towards infinity. But now, for your function, you have 9 over the square root of x plus 8. So to find the domain for this one, this is where it's a little tricky, you can only set it greater than 0. And the reason for that is, what number can never be in our denominator? 0. 0. So can we set it equal to 0? No. No. So this means our domain, since it's only a greater than symbol, would be parentheses negative 8 to infinity. Because remember, bracket means you can include the number. Parentheses means you can't include the number. I see. So the, the, the 9 above actually changes everything. Well, the, yeah. Well, not just the 9, the mm -hmm. whole function. Because it, it goes from a radical to a rational oh i see okay yeah so it doesn't matter what number was up there it's just the fact that it's now a rational function okay that makes sense cool <clears throat> All right. What else? Everybody else good? Okay, then let's do it. So we have 3.4 today, the library of functions. So we're just going to cover properties of a function, whether it's even or odd, has intercepts, is it symmetric, 
Uh, what are the domain and range of the function? Where does it increase, decrease? Does it have a max or min? So just given a function, we should be able to find all of these components to it. So the first thing we're starting off with is the square root of x. And the first thing we want to know is, is it even, odd, or neither? So remember, we can do this graphically, and we can do it algebraically. So I guess let's go ahead and try it algebraically first. So remember it to be even. If you plug in negative x, you should get the original function back. So if I say f of negative x into the square root of x, you'll get the square root of negative x. Now, since we can't simplify this anymore, did we get the original function back? Does this look like this one? No. No, right? This does not give us the original function back, which means it can't be even, right? To be odd means you get the original function back, but the signs have changed. Well, sure, this is a negative x now, right? But the sign of the whole thing has to change. So to be odd, we would have to do our check. You would say negative, negative one times f of x, which would give me negative one times the square root of x. This means I get the negative square root of x. Now, does this negative square root of x look like this square root of negative x? Are these the same? Yes, no, maybe so. No. All right. So I had not. All right. So these are not the same, which means that it cannot be odd. So the square root of x is neither even or odd. Everybody good with that? Which means it can actually help us answer the next question. So B, determine whether the graph of the function is symmetric with the origin or y-axis. Well, since it's not even or odd, then again, our answer is neither. Because remember, if you're even, you're symmetric about the y-axis. If you're odd, you're symmetric about the origin. But since we're neither, we have no symmetry. Okay. And before we move on, I said we can check algebraically and we can check graphically. So let's go ahead and graph the square root of x. Let's get that out of the way. So I'll go down below. There we go. That's better. All right. Okay. So here we have f of x equals the square root of x. So to graph this, well, one of the easiest ways to graph functions is just to pick points. So here, I'm just going to make a small x, y chart. And for the square root of x, what number should I start off at? Could always go with good old 0. 0, good. Can we go below zero? No. No, right? So we'll start at zero, and I'll go up to one. And then I'm just going to choose numbers that I can take the square root of, and of course, numbers that can fit on this graph. So zero, one, four, nine, and sure, I'll end at 16, even though it doesn't fit in our graph. And all we're doing is taking the square root of these numbers. Zero, one, two, three, four. There we go. Okay, so now let's go ahead and plot 
these points. Yay, fun colors. So here's zero, zero. Well, that's tiny. Let's see. There you go. Too big. Right there. Zero, zero. And then one, one. And then four, two. And nine and three. So here is the square root of x, which graphically, we can see that it's not even because it's not symmetric about the y-axis. To be symmetric means it would reflect going to the left, which it does not. And to be odd, it would have to reflect across the origin going that way which of course it does not. So again, we see graphically that this is neither even or odd. Okay, so there's the square root of x. And now to answer the questions above, we wanna know, does it have any intercepts? Well, if you look at the graph, where's my x-intercept and y-intercept at? The origin. The origin, right? So the x-intercept and the y-intercept are both going to be at 0, 0. OK. And then the next one says, find the domain and range of the function. Well, this is just your basic old square root function. So for d, what would my domain be for the square root of x? It would be uh, close bracket zero to infinity. There you go. Or x greater than or equal to zero, right? Yep. Good. And then my range well, where does my range start? Zero. Zero. To infinity. To infinity. There you go. Or y is greater than or equal to. Or, there you go. Perfect. All right. <clears throat> and then E, it says, what intervals are we increasing or decreasing on? Well, remember, when you read intervals of increase, you read from left to right. And this function looks like it is what? Is it always increasing or decreasing? Always increasing. Always increasing. Starting at what value of x? Zero. Zero. And heading towards where? Infinity. There you go. Perfect. And do we have a maximum or minimum? So if we have a maximum, we have a high point. Do you see a local high point anywhere? Infinity? Well, we can say infinity, but it's not going to stop because it's constantly increasing, right? To have mm -hmm. a minimum, our graph would have to look, go something like that, or mm -hmm. a max or a min, right? So it's not curvy in that type of way. So this means that for f, we don't have a maximum, but we do have a minimum we're at. At zero, zero, right? Zero, zero, the origin. Minimum at zero, zero. Or my math lab just may say at x equals zero or something like that, but there you go. So those are just the properties of functions. So again, we practice even and odd properties, which we learned last time. We practice finding intervals of increase or decrease like the last time, domain and range, x-intercepts, y-intercepts. We learned that in what, third grade? Perfect. <laughs> okay. Maybe you did. I didn't learn that till college. <laughs> Who knows? All right. So any questions on this page? Not bad, right? Okay. Okay. So let's get to another function. Graph g of x equals 1 over x. So again, 
Let's look at this algebraically and determine whether it's even, odd, or neither. So to be even or odd, we plug in negative x for every x. So you'll get g of negative x equal to 1 over negative x. So did we get back the original function? No. no. So yes. even is out. Did we get back the original function, but the signs have changed? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah, right? Again, if you are unsure, just do your check. Take negative 1 and multiply it by your function, which means you'd get negative 1 times 1 over x, which gives me negative 1 over x or 1 over negative x. Hmm. So this proves that it is definitely odd. OK, which means we can answer the next question. If it's odd, what are you symmetric with? The origin or the y-axis? The origin. Good. Symmetric with the origin. And again, we want to do both checks. So let's go ahead and graph 1 over x. OK. Zoom, zoom, zoom. And f of x equals 1 over x. OK. So we'll make our xy chart. And we can pick every number or all numbers except for what number? Zero. Zero. Good, right? We can't have zero in the denominator. So here's the numbers I'm going to pick. I'm just going to start off at negative 2, negative 1, and then I'm going to pick, ooh, let's see, negative 1 over, yeah, I'll say negative 1 over 2, and then I'll do negative 1 over 10. Why not? You'll see why I'm picking these fractions in a second. And then I'll start with the same numbers again. 1 over 10, 1 over 2, and then 1 and 2. So you're plugging these numbers into the function above. So I plug in negative 2, I'll get negative 1 half. If I plug in negative 1, I'll get negative 1. What number am I going to get if I plug in negative 1 half? Because now you'll get 1 over negative 1 half. What's that going to give me? Would it be negative 2? That's it. Negative 2. Because you would multiply by the reciprocal, right? You'd get negative 2. And then I'd get negative 10. And then everything just would repeat, but positive. 10, 2, and then 1, and 1 half. I think these are pretty decent numbers to have to start with. All right. So let's go ahead and plot these numbers. And negative 2 and negative 1 half would be right here. And then negative 1, 1. And then negative 1 half and negative 2. And then negative 1, 10. That's like point what? Point 1 and negative 10 would be right here. OK. Now, well, let's say I picked, yeah, I could pick negative, like negative 10, right? It would put me somewhere very close to zero right there. So part of my graph looks like this. Okay. 
and then graph the next part. One, one, two and one half, and then one half and two, and then 0 0.01 or 0 0.1 and 10. And again, let's say I pick positive 10, it'll give me one over 10, which is somewhere around here. And the next piece of your graph looks like this. There we go. Okay. Which means we have the graph, which means we can answer the last questions. Does this graph have any intercepts? No. No. We don't touch the x axis or touch the y axis, right? So we say none. What? is the domain of this function. I want to say negative infinity to infinity, but I know there's a blank spot in the middle. And Good. I don't remember well, how what would that to... middle what would that middle number be? Uh negative one tenth and then one tenth. Well, what number are they not touching? Oh, zero. Oh, my God. Zero. <laughs> Good. So you would be negative infinity to zero, union, zero to infinity, right? Or x can't equal zero. What would your range be? The same? The same. Good. Because remember, range you read from bottom to top, right? Smallest to highest. So this tail is headed towards negative infinity, right? And you have to come up, and what number do you stop at? Zero again. Zero. And then you continue after zero, and you head towards infinity, right? Yes. There you go. Okay, so my range is the same. Negative infinity to zero, union, zero to infinity, or y can equal zero. Okay, and then next, intervals of decrease and increase. Read the graph from left to right. And the left side looks like it's decreasing or increasing? Decreasing. Decreasing. What interval? That is an excellent question. Good. Remember, you only state x values. Where is this tail headed? To infinity. Well, if you're going to the left. Or negative infinity, sorry. Negative infinity, right? You decrease from negative infinity. And if you follow this function, right, it's also going to stop at what number? Zero. Zero. Good. And then if you increase, well, look at this piece of the graph. One, zero to infinity. Zero to infinity. That's it. Or actually, no. Ah, nope. Got that wrong. If you look at this, is that still decreasing or increasing? It's increasing. Oh, wait, no. Right. It so decreased it infinity decreases. to zero. Good. Well, zero to infinity, right? So here, this would be an all decreasing function, meaning we would decrease on negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity. There you go. Because no matter what, your y values are decreasing. Okay, maximum, minimum, or neither?
would it be neither because it like never has a maximum or minimum? Very good. No max and no min. Good. Okay. And those are the properties of 1 over x. Any questions on that? All right. So that's just how you, I think you have questions, your homework, just asking you the same thing. Are your functions even odd and either? Are they symmetric? Do they have intercepts? What's the domain of range? So basically, can you make the graph and can you answer all the questions for the graph? So increase and decrease is only about the y-axis. So for increasing and decreasing intervals, you only state x values. But you also have to look at what your y values are doing. So we saw that in the second quadrant, no matter what, as you come from negative infinity, your y values are decreasing. So they're decreasing on the interval, x intervals, negative infinity to zero. And then we look at the next piece, and from zero to infinity, your y values are also decreasing. So whenever you state intervals of increase, decrease, or constant, you only state x values, never y values. All right. So next is piecewise functions. So a piecewise function is a function made of multiple outputs with different restrictions, right? So it's important to know how to read an actual piecewise function. So for the piecewise function given, f of x equals x plus 1 for x less than negative 2. So what this means is that if we are given an x value that is less than negative 2, this means that we get to use the x plus 1 as the output for that function. So in order to use the first output, all your x values must be less than negative 2. And then in order to use the second output, any x value given must be between negative 2 and 3. So if they give us an x value and it's between negative 2 and 3, we get to use the second output. And then for the third one, if your x values are greater than 3, then we get to use the third output for this piecewise function. So the next example is just learning how to take an x value, find out where it fits in the piecewise function, and then take that x value and plug it into the correct output. So for number one, this says, we'll start with one or a, I'll call it. A says, what is f of negative five? Now we want to know because remember, negative 5 is our x value. Which restriction does it fit in? Does it fit in the first, second, or third restriction? Is negative 5 less than negative 2? Is negative 5 between negative 2 and 3? or is negative five greater than three? So we wanna know which restriction does this X value fit in? X is less than negative two. X is less than negative two. Negative five is less than negative two. So this fits in the first restriction, which means we get to use the output of x plus 1. So what number will you plug in for x? Uh, 
negative five. That's it. So this becomes negative five plus one, which gives me negative four. Everybody good with that? We're doing it again. F of negative three. Where does that fit in? Restriction one, two, or three. One. Restriction one. Because negative three is less than negative two, right? So again, since this fits in the restriction of S le X less than negative two, we get to plug it into the first output and we get negative two. All right. Again, C. F of zero. Okay. Now when X is zero, does it fit in restriction one, restriction two, or restriction three? Two, the second one. Two, because restriction two says our x values must be between negative two and three, right? So zero is definitely between those numbers. So this means I get to use the second output. So f of zero is just five. Okay. Then. Zoom out a bit. D says F of three. So remember when X is exactly equal to three, does that fit in the first, second, or third output? The I second. Say second. The second one. Why would you say the second one? Because the third restriction does not have uh, equal, uh, like equal or greater. Very uh, and, good. So therefore, this says less than or equal to, which means we are allowed to be equal to three. So again, our output is five. Okay. Perfect. And then E, what is F of four? First, second, or third restriction? Third restriction. Third restriction, because four is definitely bigger than three, which means we get to use the output of x squared. And you'll get four squared, which gives me 16. And then last, I'll call this f. And F of 10, that's definitely which restriction? Third. The third. So you'll get 10 squared, which gives me 100. OK. And that's how you read a piecewise function. If you're given an x value, just find out which restriction it fits in. And that'll tell you which output of the piecewise you get to use. Any questions on that one? Man, it's a rough Monday. What did Super Bowl do to you? Tom Brady ruined the hopes of any team ever getting as many rings as he has. <laughs> yep. He paid all those refs off. All right. <laughs> so next is we are going to graph a piecewise function and find the domain, range, and any intercepts of the piecewise function. So for number two, we're given g of x equals 1 third x plus 3, but we can only use this if our values of x are less than 3. 
And then the second output says g of x can equal negative x if our x values are greater than or equal to three. So in order to graph a piecewise function, one of the easiest ways to do this is to make x, y charts for both functions. Why not? It's just one of the easiest ways to handle it. So I'll start with the first part of the piecewise function and I'll say x and y equals one third x plus three. And right above it, I'm gonna put the restriction so it reminds us what values we can use. So it's telling us what numbers to pick. So it says we can only choose numbers that are less than three. So this means that I'm going to start at three. And now let's choose numbers less than three. Keep in mind, you have a fraction and you don't want to graph a fraction. So give me values of that are less than three that are multiples of three that'll help you get rid of that fraction. Uh, six. Is that less than three? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it negative. Uh, yeah. Right? So you're going to choose negative six, but I'm looking for another number that's next to three. That's a multiple of three. That is less than three. You can choose Zero. two, but that'll give us a fraction. You can choose one, but that'll give us a fraction. Zero. You can choose... I believe Brianna said negative three. Negative three. Perfect. Okay. We're just someone, missing one number. Someone also said zero. Zero. Perfect. Did they? Yeah, it's kind of quiet. You're talking. Okay. All right. So I got zero, negative three, negative six, and we'll stop at negative nine because that's all that probably fits on this graph. Now take all of these values and plug them into that function for x. And three times one third is one. So I'm gonna get four. One third times zero, zero, so plus three. So I'm gonna get three. And then you see the pattern, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, before moving on though, can we actually use the value of three? Nah. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Why is that, Carl? Uh, I I think it has something to do with uh, how the function's defined. Like Carl said, since our inequality says we have to be less than three, can we actually use three? Oh, no, because no. it'll be negative, whatever. Well, it doesn't matter if it's negative. The inequality says we have to be less than three, not less than or equal to three. So that means when we plot this graph, this point will be undefined. And I guess let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to plot this function. And I'm going to start at 3, 4. And if I have a point that is undefined, then that's just going to make an open circle at 3, 4. And then we'll plot the rest. 0, 3, negative 3, 2, negative 6, and 1, and negative 9 and zero. And here's what the first part of our piecewise function looks like. Okay, now we need the second part. So 
So we'll make an XY chart for that one. And do it here. Negative X for X greater than or equal to three. So X and Y equals negative X for X greater than or equal to three, right? So this is again telling us what number to start with. So I'll start with three and I'll just go greater. Three, four, five, six, seven, why not? And then just plug them into negative X. So basically all of these will become negative. Okay, and plot them. This time we can use three because the inequality says we are greater than or equal to three. So this point will be defined. So three, negative three, which is one, two, three right here. And then everything else goes down. Okay. So we have graphed the piecewise function. And now we want to answer the other questions. Like what is the domain of this function? So what is, I can put this right underneath, why not? What would be the domain of this function? And remember, we read it from left to right. Negative infinity to infinity. All right. Negative infinity to infinity. Why do you say that? Because it goes all the way to the left, all the way to the right, and the part in the middle intercepts at three. All right, good. What about this break? It's no break because that second one includes three. Very good. Very good. So even though there's a break, there's a hole in the graph. Since this point is defined, this means that we exist at this x value, making the domain all real numbers of x. Very good. All right. What about the range? What would my range be? Negative infinity to less than four. We stop at, yeah, we stop at four. So negative infinity to four. And four gets a parentheses or bracket? It gets a bracket. Is this point included? Oh, excuse me, parentheses. <laughs> There you go, negative infinity to four. Good, okay, there's our domain, there's our range, and where are my x-intercepts and y-intercepts at? Where am I on the x-axis at? X-intercept is negative nine, zero. Negative nine, zero, and y-intercept? It's uh, zero, three. There you go. That's it. So that's how you graph a piecewise function and you find the domain and range of it. Right. You can even use good old technology to help you out too, right? This is why Desmos is pretty awesome.
I'm going to type in these functions. Y equals one third X plus three. And then next to it, I'm going to put restrictions. I'm going to say X has to be less than three and close those restrictions. And look at that, it graphed it for us there. And then I'll say y equals negative x. And again, I'll put the bracket there for x greater than or equal to three. And this has graphed everything just as we have. And these look exactly the same. So this graph is headed off towards negative infinity and we come up and stop at our undefined point, right? Three and undefined open circle, just like I said. And then if you come up here, we're at three, negative three, just as we have plotted. Okay, cool. So that's one way to check your work. All right, any questions on this one? <clears throat> Whoa. All right. With that being said, go ahead and try number three out. Let me give you guys a couple minutes. You want to take this one, Carl? Oh, no. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I ended up having, having to teach the whole second half of the lecture uh, in Frank's class because his internet just died on. Oh, man. Yeah. Wow. And when, when he came back in, like, it made me the host automatically. So we just chatted for a little bit, and he came back, and he's like, well, I guess I'll, you know, I, I offered to do it. He's like, well, I guess I'll take you up on that. Uh, and I'll record my own video. So make sure you watch that too, just in case. Uh, and then he ended the session for everybody. Uh, so I had to like get everybody into my Zoom, into my, oh, my, no. my personal Zoom section real quick. Luckily it worked, but. What's going uh, on? It's, yeah, it was a mess. That sucks. But if it's like that every week, then that's, he needs to fix something, right? Yeah. Well, he already has like two different internet providers. So he says he's going to talk to the school about see if there's something the school can do for him. I think it's just because he lives like not really off in the sticks, but he's like kind of where he's at doesn't have good internet service. Mm -hmm. It's only got it's only got DSL and satellite. So oh, that's no good. DSL. That's old. Wow. Do you want to link your uh, your OneNote so I can do the notes in there? Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Let me stop this. Stop it. And share. Anyone with link can edit. Yes. Sure to send it just to me this time. I know. <laughs> Figured if anybody messed with it, I'm like, well, you are messing with your own notes. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and share my screen and get going on this example. All right. And we're on 3.4. But which one? 
You got it. The new ones say 2021 at the top. Oh, yeah. Look at that. All right, here we go. Cool. Okay. So the first thing I'll do is make an XY chart. Jeez, so big. I don't need to. There. Okay. XY chart. Y equals X plus three. And then the first part, we can take X values from two, negative two up to one. All right. Oh no, whatever. <laughs> um, so this will give us negative two plus three. And that's equal to one. One plus three is two, so then this will be three and this will be four. And then to highlight to myself that it belongs, this point doesn't belong there, I will circle it and I'll move on to the next one. So for X, we have Y equals five. And no matter what we put in, we get a five out. So, but it says one. So we want to remember that. And we'll do the last one. For x, y equals negative x plus two. And we can take values from one on. So we'll do one, two, three, four. We'll say that's good enough. So this is negative one plus two. And that's one. Negative two plus two is zero, negative one, and then negative two. So let's go ahead and plot some of these up. So our first points are negative two, one, negative two, go up to one. And then we have negative one, two. And then we have zero, three. And we don't actually have a point here at one, four, but we do have an open circle. So we'll put that in draw this part of my line and then I'll draw this other line going off. This I think it's just stuck between two and one, right? Oh, it is. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. Ain't it though. So it's just go. like that. Okay. We'll do the next part. We go to one five and put our green dot there and then we'll do our last part and we will have at one, one, but that's not on that graph. So we have to go to a open circle. And then at two, we have zero. And then at three, we have negative one. And then at four, we have negative two. And you could actually see that this will just continue on forever because it's all values of X greater. So then we will just draw that line in there. And that's how it goes off. Okay scroll down a little bit so we want to find our domain so for a our domain is stuck between what values it seems like what our smallest value is a negative two and we can take any value from negative two up to one and then we can take one with the second rule. And then the third value says that we can take any X bigger than one, two. So our domain will be negative two to infinity. How about our intercepts? Where are our intercepts at? Anybody? No. Is there anybody out there? <laughs> Zero, three. No. 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 We have our y intercept at zero three. I heard that one, and somebody said x intercept zero two. Good stuff. And then our last part is the range of the function. So our range, the highest value we have defined for a y is here at one five, and then it just goes on down. So the range of our function, well, I should guess I should write this as domain and highlight that. So the range of our function will then be, nope, I'm doing it backwards, whoops. 
it's negative infinity to five bracket because it's defined there. And that's that one. I think there's a gap though, right? My math lab won't take that. No, it's covered the whole way. Oh no, there is. Yeah, 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 you're right. So yeah, I didn't notice this, but right here, there's a gap. You cannot see that color at all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, it'll look better on the notes when you guys have it. Um, so there's a gap there and there's a gap between, let me see if I can erase that and pick a different color. Yeah, I can. All right. Let's do, uh, let's do this like fuchsia green thing. I don't know. So there's a gap here and it's from, looks like the last value we have, I guess would be four to five in the y's. So our range will actually be negative infinity to four, and it's not defined there, union five. Is that how you do it for just a single point? Yep. Yeah. Crazy. So I, My I math never math write it like that this. In, uh, curly braces for the isolated uh, ranges. Oh, so for this, they have my math lab has it like this. Yeah. I'm trying to find it. I just did one a little while ago. This is how that's how my math lab has it. It says describe as a unit of the intervals negative infinity to four in parentheses and the set of nine. Mm. And nine is curly braces. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, my math lab's dumb, so <laughs> good luck is the best I can tell you. Yeah, I say normally I would see it written like this for me. Y is less than four, Y equals five. That's two separate rules, but you can uh, you can just never do that unless you're a math major. So, don't sweat that. All right. Sweet. And that's it, y'all. That's three point four. <laughs>